Whether you're a skeptic or a believer, join me, Rob McConnell, as together we'll investigate the world of the paranormal and the science of parapsychology here on the Exxon Radio TV show on XZBN and the Exxon TV channel on Simul TV. Since 1990, the Exxon Radio TV show has been the place where people dare to believe and dare to be heard. Together, we'll investigate UFOs, aliens, ghosts, Bigfoot, psychic phenomena, lake monsters, conspiracy theories, government cover-ups, the truth embargo, alien abductions, ESP, haunted locations from around the world, and so much more. With over 28 years of broadcasting and more than 4,500 individual guests, the Exxon is truly a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality, as evidenced by the credibility, integrity, and professionalism of the guests that we bring to our international audience. If you have seen a UFO, had a close encounter, seen a ghost, Bigfoot, lake monster, or a story that you would like to share or have investigated, contact me, Rob McConnell, by sending me your email to xzone at xzoneradiotv.com or you can call toll-free 1-800-610-7035, extension 143, and on Skype, Exxon Radio TV. For more information on the Exxon Radio TV show with yours truly, Rob McConnell, visit www.exxoneradiotv.com or www.exxonetvchannel.com or simultv.com and xzbn.net. Until next we meet here in the X-Zone from our broadcast center and studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Always remember X-Zone Nation. Keep your eyes to the sky and your heart in the light. The X-Zone Radio Show with Rob McConnell is largely an opinion talk show. All opinions, comments, or statements of fact expressed by Rob McConnell's guests are strictly their own and are not to be construed as those of the Exxon Radio Show or endorsed in any manner by Rob McConnell, Relmar McConnell Media Company, the Exxon Broadcast Network, its affiliated networks, stations, employees, or advertisers. All Hit Radio To the X Zone, a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. Now, here's your host, Rob McConnell. And welcome back to the x I am Rob McConnell. We're coming to you from our broadcast center and studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. If you would like to send me an email, it's the same email address I've had for 30 years, x at x com. On all social media sites, x Radio TV, to find out about the programming we have available for you 24-7, 365. On the x Broadcast Network, visit www.xzbn.net. And for the x TV channel, on Simul TV Channel 21, X, uh, let me see, www.simultv.com. And every Tuesday night here in the Hamilton, uh, Toronto area, we are on cable 14 at 9.30 every Tuesday night. My guest this hour is Brad Bradley, and Brad began his working career as a chemist fresh out of college with the West Virginia Air Pollution Control Commission. He then moved on as an uh, analytical chemist at Union Carbide Corporation. Upon merging with Dow Chemical Corporation, they saw it fit to make him a lab- laboratory information technology site expert, which later led to his career as a distant learning coordinator. Union Carbide and then Dow Chemical also trained him in facilitation, team building, Six Sigma, and Apollo root cause analysis, among many other subjects. He is currently a systems manager for a state government agency. 
Now, Brad became interested in the paranormal research after attending a public event where he saw something he just could not explain. He then became research coordinator for the Center for Paranormal Research and Investigation, which is his current role. Now, for information on the Center for Paranormal Research and Investigation, visit their website at www.centerpri.org and on Facebook, forward slash V-A-C-P-R-I. Joining me now is Brad Bradley. And Brad, welcome to the X-Zone. Well, thank you for having me. Let me now, let me ask you, uh, Brad, what was that event or that something you couldn't explain at that event that you went to see that, that started you on your journey into the paranormal? Well, um, I uh, was a big fan of a, of a popular uh, ghost hunting TV show at mm-hmm. the time, and uh, you know I just liked watching the, the show and the interaction between the characters and such, and, and I was a huge skeptic during that time period, right. and uh, my wife got me tickets to go meet the folks from the from the show at an inn they owned up in New Hampshire. Mm-hmm. And uh, lo and behold, while I was at that event, I saw something uh, like a, a, a full-form figure walk between me and the window in the room we were standing in, and it was nobody there. That's what did it. And And what happened after that? You know, how did you keep pursuing the interest in the paranormal, and how did you end up with the Center for Paranormal Research and Investigation? Well, um, it just so happens that uh, our organization is a member of the TAPS family, mm-hmm. and um, the, you know, TAPS is the, the Atlantic Paranormal Society. Um, we're a member of that family, and, you know, they're affiliated with the Ghost Hunters TV show. And uh, I spoke, I was speaking with Grant Wilson up there at, the, at that inn, who was part of that TV show, and he uh, um, told me that I needed to get in touch with this particular group because he knew who they were and that they were, uh, you know, they they basically pursued what I was after. And so I got in touch with uh, Bobby Atrastain, our uh, president, right? And uh, and she is the one that uh, uh, told me it's like, yep, we need somebody like you. You're a chemist. Come on board and uh, and. Then uh, I started doing the coordinating all the research projects from the organization because I have that kind of skill set. And there you go. Now, what what can a chemist uh, contribute to a paranormal investigation? Well, I mean, you know, a lot of people, you know, besides the fact that, uh, I I, I mean, as a chemist, you know, Mm -hmm. I typically dealt with chemicals and such. But, uh, um, you know, also uh, I was was taught... um, the different analytical skills, um, you know, basically like, you know, not just the scientific method, but experimental design, that mm-hmm. kind of stuff. And we apply all that in the center now on most of our uh, research projects that we do. We uh, have a theory. We design an experiment to to look at the theory. We then uh, move on and uh, uh, we perform the experiment, gather the data, draw our conclusions. If we need to change the experiment, we do that. And it's an evergreen process. It's over and over again. So what have you discovered so far? Well, um, we've uh, found out several things. Um, you know, a lot of people, you know, they talk about uh, uh, what they call residual haunts. Right. And uh, what what I decided to do was, you know, I thought that what I saw at this end might be residual. So uh, what I started doing is designing an experiment where, uh, you know, um, I noticed there, might, there was a bit of an environmental change in the room when this happened as well. I just felt it. So what, uh, what I decided to do was to see if I could measure that environmental change when mm-hmm. people perceive something visually or audibly uh, that they might consider paranormal and, uh, and try and do some correlation there. And over time, we've gathered thousands and thousands of data points over this. And um, it's beginning to look like there might actually be, for a residual haunt, there might actually be a natural cause for this. You know, we haven't, you know, determined what that cause is, but we, it seems to be pointing that direction. Where, uh, you know, we found out that uh, also if you treat a, uh, a per- uh, like a perceived manifestation mm-hmm. as a point source, all the environmental stuff that happens around that point source only radiates about three or four feet from that point source. So if your sensors 
aren't within that three or four foot radius, you don't get anything. So we also found that out as well. And uh, you know, we've we've uh, also we've determined also that there seems to be a uh, shift in magnetic field, uh, geomagnetic field, mind you, along with a spike in ionizing radiation when these things occur. Now, if if the instrumentation has to be within three to four feet of the data point, does that mean if a person is standing outside of that three to four foot data point uh, area, that they will not encounter that paranormal experience? It's possible. Uh, we have noticed that there will be people standing side by side, you know, mm-hmm. like three or four feet apart, sure. and one person will hear something and the person standing next to them won't. Well, could that just that be doesn't... because of the the uh, the, uh, the hearing capabilities that person A has compared to person B? Could be. Uh, we, we don't know that for sure. Um, uh, we just know that uh, anecdotally we've, mm-hmm. we've seen that occur. But uh, for the most part, though, um, you know, we have... Uh, for the most part, we've run into where everybody in the room heard it, but the sensors didn't pick up anything because they weren't anywhere near it. Um, but, uh, like, we might have one sensor that was near it, and it picked up something, mm-hmm. whereas the other sensors did not. So at, at that point, we think that that's, where, that's why we're, uh, we're, we're thinking that there's a, a finite radius to that environmental uh, effect. But, but if everyone in the room heard it, it didn't register on that piece of equipment. How do you explain well, that? Well, it, it you know it could be picked up audibly. Mm-hmm. Um, it's the environmental changes we were looking at weren't picked up because you have to think the environmental changes we're looking at are temperature, barometric pressure, humidity, um, like uh, vibration, sure, and all, you know, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And when we're looking at that, we uh, you know we can hear things without having you know we're not we're, you know we don't have to have. An environmental change, like right now, you're hearing me. Yes. So we don't have an environmental change around that per se. But what we're noticing is, is when somebody hears something or somebody mm-hmm. sees something around that point source, there is a change in those in those parameters that I just laid out for you. Okay, I'm having a little bit of problems following this. Okay. Well, in in your opinion, what do the the atmospheric or the other changes have to do with the person hearing a, a sound. I, I don't understand this. Not a thing. Basically, what we think is going on is that whatever is causing mm-hmm. the uh, manifestation yeah. is producing the environmental effects. So and, those and, environmental effects don't affect the people that are hearing or seeing it at all. We're just using them as a detector the people as a detector to say, I see something or I hear something. Well, in your opinion, and uh, I've got to say, I just, uh, let, let me come back to you on the other side of this break because I don't want to, uh, sure. I don't want to interrupt you. All right, stand by. Brad uh, Bradley is our guest this hour, www.centerpri.org and on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash VACPRI. This is the Exxon. I am Rob McConnell, and we're coming to you from our broadcast center and studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Are you a skeptic or are you a believer? Either way, let me know. Send me an email, exxon at exxonradiotv.com. Brad Bradley and I return on the other side of this break. Don't go away. It's hard to listen to the news without realizing we're living in volatile, unprecedented times. Yet never has there been such an opportunity to transform the human condition. As old structures fail, where can we find the guidance to co-create a better way? Find Your Path Home is an ever-evolving, leading-edge information, education, and healing resource center designed to support and guide you on your path to unity and enlightenment. Based on sound principles employed by Shaman Worldwide, we provide techniques that can support you through the current transitions, offering online shamanic classes, 
international long-distance Shamana healing sessions, complimentary Mission Evolution radio episodes and Stairway to Heaven TV vignettes, seminars, retreats, and much more. All of this can be found on findyourpathhome.com. So I was watching the X-Zone TV channel last night when I was abducted by aliens and they kept repeating to me over and over again, simultv.com, simultv.com. What's simultv.com? That's what I asked them. They had it written on the side of their UFO. How do you spell that? UFO. No, I mean simultv.com. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. Right. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. Interesting that you were abducted by aliens in a simultv.com UFO last night. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Now that you mention it, I remember now last night I was awakened from a deep sleep. My great-grandmother was standing there. She said she'd come from the hereafter to tell me about simultv.com. She even spelled it out for me. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com, sonny boy. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com, sonny boy. Wow. Yeah. Guys, you'll never guess what my psychic guru just told me. SIMULTV.com. Exactly. Are you guys psychic too? Of course. We all know about SIMULTV.com. SIMULTV.com. Welcome back, everyone. Brad Bradley is our special guest this hour, www.centerpri.org, and on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash V-A-C-P-R-I. Um, before we went to the break, we were talking about how certain instruments um, need to be within three to four feet of a data point in order for it to register any changes. Now, if people are hearing a sound and yet nothing is being registered on the equipment. How do we know then that the sound is actually affecting the environment and is going to change settings? Well, uh, basically, when you, when you look at it statistically, mm-hmm. when you have all these data points and you do the big data analysis, um, you know, just throwing all this stuff into Microsoft Excel or something like that, and you perform the standard data analysis on some looking for outliers and such, it just points to the fact that uh, it seems it just seems like there's a finite radius to the environmental effects around that point source. And uh, you know, because if we you know put we have one sensor that picks up something, mm-hmm. and the exact same kind of sensor four feet away does not. That should that tells us right there, and we have hundreds of those that uh, that we've picked up. And you know, if you if you look at it like uh, in the grand scheme of things, um, say you have a uh, uh, like a, a ghost standing in the corner, mm-hmm. let's say, and uh, you know, I'm just saying ghost in the in the uh, colloquial sense, but the you know the you know you have a ghost standing in this corner, and then all of a sudden you know, they move, or they, you know, they make the appearance, let's say. And the sensors in the corner, you know, will pick up whatever's going on, but the one three or four feet away does not. And then the one three or four feet past that does not. And that, that kind of stuff, it, 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 it really plays out as if you have a, it's like Battleship, the game Battleship, <laughs> pretty much. And uh, you, you're really, uh, it's hit and miss where you're going to get this, this kind of information. We've been able to really blanket a room with sensors, and and sure enough, you know we'll get uh, a block of sensors here that say something's going on when the sound happens, but none of the other sensors in the room pick it up. So we do have that evidence. All right. So if other people are in the room, and everyone here in the room hears the sound. What's the significance of this? Could it just mean that certain frequencies are inaudible to certain pieces of equipment, and this is what you're getting with uh, true and false readings? Well, it's uh, you know you got to look at what we're what we're actually measuring. What are you measuring? You know, we're measuring temperature and barometric pressure, uh-huh. and we're measuring uh, like oh gosh, light levels, ultraviolet light levels, infrared light levels, um, you know, different things like mm-hmm. that. And uh, it's entirely possible for something like that to happen in a in a finite area, 
like especially temperature and barometric pressure, ionizing radiation, uh, changes in geomagnetic field, that kind of stuff. That kind of stuff can happen in a finite area, whereas if you're outside that area, you're not going to experience it just by the sheer nature of the of uh, uh, especially geomagnetic field because mm-hmm. it it drops off in an ex, you know uh, uh, an exponential waveform out away from the point source. Is it possible that these environmental changes have nothing to do with the paranormal? That these are all these are all naturally occurring phenomena? Well, it's possible. I mean, you know, what we've got though is uh, the it's highly probable that um, that these are related to whatever that perceived manifestation is, based on how the experiment was designed and uh, where the the location of the sensors and what we were rec- you know measuring and that kind of thing. What, what, is the think, ul- what is the ultimate goal of these experiments? Well, right now we're trying to figure out what, what exactly are residual mm-hmm. manifestations and what is causing the, the residual manifestation. Because everybody thinks of them as a recording, right. you know, on the environment. Yeah. Um, you know, and also in, in collecting all this data, we didn't just run into residual stuff. We ran mm-hmm. into interactive stuff. And uh, while we were recording this data, and that totally, you know, that totally throws that experiment out the window because you can't perform the same experiment on interactive as you do on residual because residual is reproducible, interactive stuff is not. So uh, that's, you know, we've kind of defined this experiment to where we're only looking at the residual stuff that we ran into. And sometimes we may have actually captured something that wasn't residual but was interactive, but we, you know, we easily could have mistaken it for Mm -hmm. residual or vice versa. But we've gotten enough data points to where, you know, when you have a huge number of data points like this, you can go in and when you do the statistics, it it just jumps right at it. The the trends are all there. The outliers are all there. Everything, all the anomalies are there. But what happens if the statistical analysis has nothing to do with, with the actual paranormal event? Like you're talking about data points. You're talking about statistics. How about hard evidence? Well... When you have a recorded sound mm-hmm. or a recorded video mm-hmm. of something that occurs, yeah, there's there's the uh, the what you know what they might call anecdotal evidence. You know, it's 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 like something happened. We now have know that something happened, or if somebody in the room had a personal experience, we know something happened. And at that point, if something happened, that's when we look at all the sensors and see which ones pinged and which ones didn't. With all, and, uh, yeah, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, and uh, you know, and based on where those ones ping, we mm-hmm. also can uh, do a sound mapping of a room and determine the area where the sound was. So wherever the sound was, if it's and if the sensors were we were we the, the sound mapping the audio mapping of the room where the sound came from. Um, at that point, you know, we have a really good correlation, so we consider that um, positive test results with all the got, with all the paranormal groups that are out there these days you know just in uh-huh. southern california there's over 3000 yeah. and you know the, all these people that have been doing this for years and years and years there has been no concrete evidence to substantiate any claims how come well um uh i it could be that uh, these these folks aren't really approaching it like they need to um, it could be because, uh, you know, we've actually collected data, hard data, mm-hmm. you know, the kind of data you can hand off to a physicist or, uh, or yeah, I, 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 under- I understand the, I understand the importance about data, but what about evidence? You know, data is one thing. Let's get away from the analytical side here. Let's get down to the brass tacks. What evidence is there? Physical evidence, not anecdotal evidence, but real hardcore evidence. Is there any? Well, you know, how do you define hardcore evidence? Because for us, hardcore evidence is those is the data, is the sensor reading. Because we collect those over time. And right, but you don't... They change when they don't. You don't know what is causing those sensor readings. So until you establish what is causing the sensor readings, that is just a data. It is not... Fa- it's, it's analytical fact, yes, but it's not physical evidence. Well, you know, how you, how you actually perform an experiment, though, mm-hmm. um, you know, Rob, is... You know, you have to start with the theory. The theory is that 
whatever's making the noise or whatever's, you know, visualizing out there is going to change the environment. That's the theory. And as soon as we started with that, we collected the data around that and said, well, yeah, there is an environmental effect. We know that. That is fact. And, uh, and we have the, uh, whenever there's an audible, whenever we hear something or mm-hmm. we see something that is not, that is of the paranormal, we know that there's an environmental effect around it. Okay, so how do you know if it's paranormal or if it's just an unknown anomaly that occurs naturally and has nothing to do with the paranormal? Well, that's what I'm trying to tell you, is it's starting to look like mm-hmm. that the residual type stuff is caused by nature. Okay, it makes a lot of sense since we're, uh, you know, uh, the uh, the electromagnetic fields and being in audio and uh, broadcasting, we know that the old analog yeah. tapes, you know, they had to be really uh, scrubbed very well by a demagnetizer, or else we'd get what we used to call ghost whispers on the on the uh, on the tape that we would use again. How- yeah, I mean, mm. it, you know, we have a. Uh, you know, we're, right now, in regards to magnetic fields, you know, we're just we're just kind of looking at geomagnetic fields. But yeah, I mean, it. it <coughs> pardon me. Yeah. I want to get a drink of water here. But uh, you know, the um, the 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 thing that uh, a lot of people don't realize is that as you collect that information, even on even with magnetic field or you know audio tapes or videotapes or mm-hmm. still pictures or whatever, as you collect all that information, those are just pieces of the puzzle as part of the experiment, and then eventually you're going to come up to the point where you, you're you able to uh, have a theory about causation. Is, is it, we, mm-hmm. uh, we've got to take a break shortly, so I'll let you grab your uh, glass of water. But is it possible that the established scientific methods that we have today are not going to discover the answers that everybody wants because everybody is thinking inside of the box instead of getting outside of the box and looking at the phenomenon. Is it possible? It's possible. I mean, you know, when, when you, if people are looking for a spiritual answer, mm-hmm. there, there's no way to get that answer based on, uh, you know, the standard scientific sure. method. All right, Brad, stand by. We've got to take our news break at the bottom of the hour. Exonation. Nation, Brad Bradley is our guest www.centerpri.org and on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash VACPRI. I'm Rob McConnell. This is the Exxon. Don't go away. here and they've been here for thousands of years making their presence known in the shadows. They might be seen by a lonely motorist on a deserted road late at night or by a frightened and confused husband in the bedroom he is sharing with his wife. But who are they? What do they want? Why are they here? Perhaps most concerning, has the government been aware of their presence all along? The new book by Eli Marzulli, UFO Disclosure, The 70-Year Cover-Up Exposed, delves into the world of UFOs. Can full disclosure be soon? Order now and receive a free hour and 37-minute DVD on the UFO phenomenon, UFOs Are Real. Get both the book and the DVD, a $40 value, for only $19.99. To order your book and DVD today, go to lamarzuli.net. That's L-A-M-A-R-Z-U-L-L-I dot net. Rob McConnell here, presenting an overview for Nicholas Paul Jinnix, author of a fascinating book, Amen. It presents facts revealed by Egyptologists, facts that enable us to understand why Amen is the beginning of creation of God. It provides recommendations for religious leaders of the major religions to unify their beliefs and teach the word of God, love one another. Amen informs people how mankind conceived God. It was the Egyptians that developed the concepts of a soul, a hereafter, and son of God, and finally, After the worship of many gods, 
they conceived the belief in one universal God, the maker of all there is. For more information, visit www.futureofgodamen.com. That's www.futureofgodamen.com. You have heard of the X Zone? Now watch it on Simo TV, plus 500 video games, live TV channels, free video on demand, worldwide, and more. Does this sound like tomorrow's television? Well, it is, but you can have it today, right now. It is Simo TV. Simo TV offers what the others only wish they could provide 15 exclusive channels like X Zone, Sci Fi, and Horror. We are worldwide. No other provider offers that. 500 built in video games. No need to have an extra expensive system. We have them included. Free video on demand. Live streaming events from around the world. Interactive online network and much more. Tomorrow's TV today. Simul TV. Sound too good to be true? Well, it's not. You can have Simul TV today. Sign up at simultv.com. Do it today. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, Brad Bradley is our guest this hour, www.centerpri.org, and on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash VACPRI. What is the importance of the investigation into the residual haunting compared to the, um, you know, the spontaneous apparitions or the spontaneous hauntings that happen? You, know, you mean like the interactive type stuff? Moving objects, uh, well, uh, well, being I, touched. That kind of thing. Well, I, I don't. I, I wouldn't call that interactive, but yeah, I guess that's what it's classified in the in the biz as. Um, what's the significance? Why Why do you want to spend so much time on the residuals? Well, we got to start somewhere, and uh, that you know, to uh, to somebody that's a that's a hard scientist or mm-hmm. even a soft scientist, like a psychologist or a sociologist. You, uh, that's low hanging fruit. You can, you can actually measure it. It tends to be reproducible. It's just, it's, it's perfect for that kind of experiment. So, um, we're, we want to go in and if we can figure out what's happening residually, then mm-hmm. we can go ahead and set that off to one side and then move over to the, uh, like the, uh, spontaneous apparitions or the, uh, um, you know, when they actually, uh, Something might actually say your name, or you might get touched, or something might move, like a door open and shut, or something like that. Then you can move on to that kind of thing, which is a radically different thing than uh, the residual side. Okay. So, how close do you think you are to to coming up with um, a hypothesis? Well, right now, it seems like, uh, you know, initially we were trying... Mm-hmm determine if the manifestations cause the environmental effects or if the environmental effects cause the manifestation. Right. That's the first thing we had to do. And um, now it looks like that the manifestations, uh, the, the data is pointing at the fact that the manifestations are causing the environmental effects. So now we need to figure out what's causing the manifestations. You know, the, the, where you see the same person walk through a door every, every night at the same time, or, you know, you hear the same sound every night mm-hmm. at the same time or, you know, that kind of thing, the, the, the reproducible kind of residual haunts. Let, you need to figure out what's causing that. Sure. Let me ask you this. When you say the same time every night, what happens when there's a shift in the time, for example, from daylight saving to, you know, to, um, oh, my gosh, Eastern, for example? Well, that's why we, we go with... Uh, the, the UTC or Greenwich Mean Time. I mean, we, we, we stick with that. And we, we do all of our measurements using an atomic clock. Mm-hmm. And uh, that way, you know, we're down to the tenth of the second in accuracy, I mean, in precision, I mean. And um, not accuracy, sorry. And then uh, that, that way we have a really good handle on when these things really occur. And, you know, sometimes, though, it's not exactly the same time every time, and it's not every night and that kind of thing. I was just using an example. Right. 
basically. So, so how can that be a residual if there is a difference in times or a difference in days? Well, it's not interactive. That much is certain. Well, it's and, not interactive, uh, but aren't you trying... Uh, am I misunderstanding that what we're looking at is trying to discover using all these data points what these um, perpetual hauntings are all about, these apparitions that seem to have a, a time schedule. You know, uh, yeah. why, why would there be a difference in time? Why would certain days be missed if, in fact, it's, it's a residual? Well, if it's, if it, let's say that whatever's causing it isn't able to cause the manifestation depending on what the, uh, like, let's say the environment of the room is or that kind of stuff, we've, we've seen where if we aren't in the room mm -hmm. and we're re measuring this stuff remotely and we're watching it from our HQ area 300 feet away or something like that, you know, <clears throat> we've found that it happens very reproduce. It can happen very reproducibly. And soon as we walk into that room, mm -hmm. it'll stop. We've seen that time and time again. And that indicates that we've just disrupted something. And we're not sure what that is yet, and we think that has to do with the causation. So that's why we're designing new experiments around here to see what's going on. What do other members of uh, the scientific community say about your uh, experiments? Well, it depends on who you talk to. I mean, a lot of people don't even know about it. Mm -hmm. um, we try to, uh, we put it out on our website, we put it out on our Facebook page, we uh, deliver lectures at various, at various locations, and the you know, there are people out there that uh, are very interested. But then again, there's the people that don't think we should be looking at this at all because they think it's nonsense and then these residual haunts don't exist or these interactive haunts don't exist and that kind of thing. So you're always going to have those mm -hmm. people. Is it possible that those who believe will experience these events and those who don't believe for one reason or another because they have no interest will not experience these events even if they're in the same room when the event is actually happening. Well, funny you would, you would say that, because there are actual psychological experience, experiments that have been performed outside of this organization, mm -hmm. uh, where uh, people in, two people in a room will hear something, and one person is very attuned to what they're hearing, so they're picking up on it, and they can tell exactly what's going on, and they're, they're, like exci you know, you know, they're excited about it or what have you. Then the person sitting next to them didn't hear anything. And then that person... So they actually did, but they tuned it out as noise. And there are people like that. You know, they think that it's, they automatically, their brain is, is, is configured such that they just write it off. And it's something that they don't need to worry about, so they, it just goes into the back bin somewhere. And then they, and later on, they're like, yeah, I might have heard something. I think I'm not sure. Even though it was loud and really clear to the person standing next to them. Now, does this sound get recorded where it can actually be played back to the person who didn't hear it? And, yes. and Yeah. And uh, it was real interesting. Um, I can't remember the book that, uh, that this came out of, but uh, the experiment was de very detailed. And uh, it was done by a university, and uh, they basically had a guy sitting there mm -hmm. and another guy sitting, you know, 10 feet away from him, and they played the sound in the room. You know, they had normal sounds in the room, like air conditioning sounds and stuff like that. And then they played a sound in the room that sounded like a voice, and one person heard it and locked in on it, and the other person didn't. And that's because that person's, the way their brain's configured, they just went ahead and tuned it out. Hmm. So we could be missing stuff all yeah. day long, all the time, and not even realize it. But at the, at the end of the day, how will this change the way we live how will this change any of the stress that a lot of us are facing on an each on a daily basis? How will this work to better humanity? Um, to tell you the truth, in regards to uh, you know in the you know finding out about mm -hmm. the residual stuff, it's going to you know a lot of people are afraid of this stuff, and so you know the, there are people that work in some environments, and when this residual stuff happens, they quit. This is just an example, mind you. 
and they, they might quit or they might, you know, they might say they have to move to a different building because mm-hmm. the stuff's going on around them and they're scared. Right. So, uh, you know, finding out exactly what it is might help, you know, mitigate the fear and eventually maybe mitigate the actual manifestations themselves if it's really natural, mind you. Now, if it, you know, in regards to interactive stuff, like I told you before, we haven't even started experimenting for that stuff yet. We just know it's there because we've all experienced it. Right. And uh, it's just something, though, that doesn't fit in the same bin as the residual stuff. It's real obvious that it doesn't. How much, so of, this, get, how much of this haunting residual or any other kind can be put to mind over matter? Because you want to believe, because you want to have the experience? Well, now you're talking telekinesis. No, I'm talking. I'm, ta- I'm not talking about telekinesis. I'm talking about people who investigate the paranormal. You know, if, if you confess that you will possess it, a mind over matter. They hear what they want to hear. They see what they want to see. They experience what they want to. How much of this? Well, how much of this could possibly be this, the answer that people really don't want to acknowledge and face? Well, that's that's entirely true, and that plays right into that same psychological experiment mm-hmm. we were, I was just got, I just talked about. You know, the the thing that we're trying to do too, and what we're doing with this current line of experimentation is we're trying to eliminate that variable altogether. You know, we're we're recording everything. You know, we if we hear the anomaly, we don't try to figure out what it's saying. We right. don't try to figure out who the thing is. We just know we have an anom- an, an anomalous sound or an anomalous picture or video and then we know we know that that's what we've got and that's our manifestation what would you consider an anomal, um, anomalous uh, picture well um we, we we tend not to uh look at a lot of pictures people send us because it's too easy to fake those pictures sure. it's just way too easy yep. so uh but if we're standing in the room mm-hmm. and we see something with our own two eyes and we take a picture of that that we saw, and if multiple people saw it, and we took a picture of it and multiple people saw it, then that picture would be considered a, a picture of an anomaly. And so we actually could use that. That doesn't happen very often because we tend to rely more on video and audio than, than still pictures. All right, but, stand uh, by. That, We've got to take our final break. Exonation. Nation, Brad Bradley is our guest for this hour, www.centerpri.org. And on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash VACPRI. I'll be back on the other side of this break as we wrap up this hour here in the Exxon from our broadcast center and studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. I'm Rob McConnell. Don't go away. here and they've been here for thousands of years making their presence known in the shadows they might be seen by a lonely motorist on a deserted road late at night or by a frightened and confused husband in the bedroom he is sharing with his wife but who are they what do they want why are they here perhaps most concerning has the government been aware of their presence all along The new book by Ellie Marzulli, UFO Disclosure, The 70-Year Cover-Up Exposed, delves into the world of UFOs. Can full disclosure be soon? Order now and receive a free hour and 37-minute DVD on the UFO phenomenon, UFOs Are Real. Get both the book and the DVD, a $40 value, for only $19.99. To order your book and DVD today, go to lamarzuli.net. That's L-A-M-A-R-Z-U-L-L-I dot net. So I was watching the X-Zone TV channel last night when I was abducted by aliens, and they kept repeating to me over and over again, Simultv.com, Simultv.com. What's Simultv.com? That's what I asked them. They had it written on the side of their UFO. How do you spell that? UFO. No, I mean Simultv.com. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. Right. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. Interesting that you were abducted by aliens in a Simultv.com UFO last night. Oh, yeah? Yeah. 
Now that you mention it, I remember now last night I was awakened from a deep sleep. My great grandmother was standing there. She said she'd come from the hereafter to tell me about Simultv.com. She even spelled it out for me. SIMULTV.com, Sonny Boy. SIMULTV.com. SIMULTV.com, Sonny Boy. Wow. Yeah. Guys, you'll never guess what my psychic guru just told me. SIMULTV.com. Exactly. Are you guys psychic too? Of course. We all know about Simultv.com. SIMULTV.com. Welcome back. Brad Bradley is our special guest this hour. His uh, website is centerpri.org and on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash VACPRI. When uh, the CPRI goes out and uh, conducts a paranormal investigation, how, how is it done? Well, um, first, you know, we, uh, what I do is I coordinate mm-hmm. the actual, um, you know, research projects, not the going to the house because somebody called us and said they have a ghost um so how how i do my part is i uh you know basically we're looking for a location that has activity that's going to meet the you know the parameters of what we're we're looking for and trying to experiment with and then we design an experiment around whatever theory we're getting ready to test and we run the experiment at the location collect all the information try to draw some kind of conclusion and then we move on from there now, when we go, when somebody calls us or sends us a help request mm-hmm. and we go to that location, we try to look at what those people are say they're experiencing, and then we try to design experiments around that so that we can run those quickly and easily at the location that the people, uh, where, where they say they're experiencing activity. So there, there's two different ways we handle this. But isn't the object of these people calling you to, uh, you know, they obviously want help. How do they get the help if, you know, you're doing scientific you know, experiments? Well, what we do is we preface it up front when they when they contact us and tell them that we can't. We're not going to be able to a tell them what's what you know if there's a real uh, like a dead person haunting their house, or we're not going to be able to give them a name. We're not going to be able, we're just going to be able to tell them that something's going on, and we don't you know in regards to help if they need mm-hmm. more help beyond that, we're going to refer them elsewhere. Because that's, you know, we, we don't, you know, we have, when we go to places, we tend to have, you know, police officers, uh, uh, re- the nurses, doctors, that, that kind of, those kind of folks that go on these home visits so that we can actually look at the environment around the place and, and make sure that there's nothing, you know, naturally going on there that's causing whatever issue they're having. Why would, why would somebody call a paranormal research group instead of calling their local city engineer to have the engineers come out to do a, a site analysis before calling you folks? And it's funny you should ask that, too, <laughs> because people want to think there is something else out there. Mm-hmm. They want to think that, um, you know, I've, I've, there's this banging in my wall. I know it's, it's, it, it can't be a mouse or it can't be a rat or it can't be a pipe. It's got to be my dead grandpa. And then they, they go and they, they automatically assume that. Whereas when we go in there, the first thing we're going to look for is that rat or mouse or you know animal activity or the pipe in the wall or what have you. And that's the first thing we're going to look for. So you know these uh, folks just want to, to, to believe that there's something going on that's just a little bit out of their control. They've got a little bit of control, but it's just a little bit out of their control, and that, that gives them some sort of excitement. And that happens a lot. There's an, there was an article that was just on uh, one of the major news networks. It could be CNN or one of those other ones. But they, they actually talk about this very thing. So let me ask you this. What kind of influence do all these uh, so-called reality TV shows have on these people experiencing the the sounds and the sights that they truly believe are paranormal because they've watched a TV show that in all aspects are anything but real. You know, how does, what, how does this play into the 
paranormal scenario these days? Well, it makes everyone an expert. Mm. And uh, that's, that's a shame because there are very few of those. And, uh, you know, everybody thinks that they, they, they know what's going on. Mm-hmm. You know, look at the number of teams like you're talking about, like yep. down in Southern California. Thousands and thousands and thousands. They all think that they, you know, based on getting, doing, doing what they see on TV, mm-hmm. you know, they're, they, they're, they want to experience something just to know that, they, that, they, that, you know, they can experience it. And that's, that's commendable, which is fine, but it's not going to get you anywhere. And it's also not going to help the people that you say you're helping. As a matter of fact, if you misinterpret something that's actually natural in the house, mm-hmm. you could almost be called up and, and, you know, be called negligent at that point. And that, that brings you into, into legal type stuff. So you don't want, I mean, you know, when you're performing research, you're just collecting data and you're trying to draw conclusions and that's all you're doing. If you go out there and you say you're going to help somebody find out if there's a demon in their house, you are grossly negligent. I'm sorry. Then how are how are they able to get away with this? How come there is no nobody's, going, nobody's holding them accountable? Why not? I don't know. I wish I knew, but uh, I do know there is uh, there are you know little bits and pieces you hear now and then of of uh, these teams that are um, that are saying stuff like at the like they go into a location mm-hmm. and the person in the location is mentally unstable and they tell this person they have a a demon in their house, and the person tries to kill themselves because of it. And they do that, but they, they I mean, and, and they, they just don't think anything of it because they don't realize the dangers of it. That's why, you know, we try to enlist, you know, we try to enlist uh, some of our mandatory reporters down here in the States um, to help out with these home visits like that. We don't do a lot of those, but, um, you know, when we do, we really focus on that particular item. I understand that you've uh, also done research uh, within the field uh, when it comes to radiation. Tell us about that. Oh, yeah. Uh, one of the uh, parameters we started measuring mm-hmm. was uh, radiation because we, uh, you know, when you're doing these research projects in these houses that were built in the 1600s and 1700s and you're in the basement, there's a real good chance you're going to run into radon. And so what we decided to do was to try to start using Geiger counters to measure radi- radiation and get dosage down in those basements and stuff. Well, what we found out was when there was a, and uh, like if we ran the, the Geiger counter near some of our other sensors and there was a, uh, one of those anomalous noises or, or that kind of thing, and those, all those sensors went off, we ended up, uh, we ended up doing... Uh, getting a spike in um, uh, ionizing radiation, which is, you know, uh, gamma radiation, Mm -hmm. alpha, uh, alpha, beta, gamma, that kind of thing. The kind of things that causes changes in materials, you know, like like, uh, you get from Fukushima or something like that. We saw spikes, and these spikes were considerable. They weren't weren't small spikes. You know, say the background radiation was 15 Mm -hmm. counts per minute. It would jump all the way up to 60 and 70 counts per minute. And, and come right back down again. It, it, it wouldn't stay. So we, we're trying to figure out what's, what's going on there. And at the same time we get those spikes, we get a shift in the, uh, in the geomagnetic field on all three axes because, you know, magnetic field is measured in three axes. And so we're like, holy cow, you know, what's going on here? So that's what we're looking at now. We're trying to focus on those sensors more than the other ones, trying to figure out how that can happen because that naturally occurring you can't get spikes like that. Typically, radiation goes up, it kind of stays for a while, and then it might gradually come back down again. It doesn't spike, like uh, go straight up and back down within seconds. So what do you do with this information when it comes to uh, something that could be harmful to the inhabitants of the house that you come up with uh, during, your, during your research? Well, we let them know. And it's like, you know, listen, you know, you've got, you've either got a... Uh, you know, uh, some bad wiring causing uh, really high electromagnetic fields Mm -hmm. in your house at at 60 hertz range, we tell them that because they need to do something about it because they might end up with a fire or something like that. So we go ahead and give them all that information. And uh, we document that we give it to them. And if we we, uh, detect, like, um, you know, say we do pick up a lot of standing radiation in in their uh, basement area or something like that, we might let them know they might want to get a radon test done 
that kind of thing. So we do we do let them know these uh, these differences. Do you let the municipalities know that you've uh, come up with these readings and that there could be a possible problem? Uh, we yeah, that's entirely up to the property owner. Um, but if you uh, know this and the property owner doesn't do something and something happens to the property owner, isn't that negligence on your part? Um, not really. Not in, the, not in the eyes of the law. What we've done is we've given the information. You get a release and sign? And if they choose not to do something with it, then it's, it, you know, they're the ones that are negligent. Do you get we've a, given them all the information. Do you get a release uh, signed? Yes. So you kind here's of... The, here's you know. the information. We've warned you that there's mm-hmm. a problem. And... Um, you know, you need to do something about it. Here's an example of people you need to contact from the city or from the county that can help right. you. And uh, if you choose, not, you know, basically if you choose not to do something about it, it's your own fault. We've got about 45 seconds left, uh, Brad. How can uh, how can someone contact your organization if, they, uh, if they'd if they like to have you guys uh, do an experiment in their house? Well, basically, um, you can uh, contact. The best way is either... Uh, um, you can contact me at uh, brad at virginiaghosts.com, or you can go to our Facebook page, and there's an actual form you can fill out to give us more information. It's like uh, it says uh, request help or something right. like that. Brad, I want to thank you for joining us tonight. Great talking to you. And Exonation, if you'd like to get more information about uh, Brad or the um, CPRI, once again, their website is centercpri.org. And on Facebook, it is facebook.com forward slash va cpri i'll be back on the other side of this break for with most uh, networks and affiliates but if i'm not remember always keep your eyes to the sky and your heart to the light i'm rob mcconnell this is the exxon If you are looking for a safe, zero-calorie, natural option to the harmful artificial sweeteners on the market today, Just Like Sugar is what you're looking for. Just Like Sugar is a wonderful natural alternative for those health-conscious people who choose a calorie-restricted diet with a great, pure, sweet flavor that tastes just like sugar. Just Like Sugar is a great natural option for people suffering from diabetes and may be useful in restricted diet programs where standard sugars are not allowed and does not cause a laxative effect of some other sweeteners. Just Like Sugar comprises a perfect blend of chicory root fiber, natural calcium, natural vitamin C, and Just Like Sugar sweetness comes from the natural flavors from the peel of the orange. Just Like Sugar is a natural alternative to harmful artificial sweeteners and will change the way that you believe all natural sweetener products taste. Just Like Sugar is available at your local Whole Foods markets, Wild Oats markets, Henry's, Sun Harvest, and many other fine natural food stores in the U.S., Canada, and worldwide. They are here, and they've been here for thousands of years, making their presence known in the shadows. They might be seen by a lonely motorist on a deserted road late at night, or by a frightened and confused husband in the bedroom he is sharing with his wife. But who are they? What do they want? Why are they here? Perhaps most concerning, has the government been aware of their presence all along? The new book by Ellie Marzulli, UFO Disclosure, The 70-Year Cover-Up Exposed, delves into the world of UFOs. Can full disclosure be soon? Order now and receive a free hour and 37-minute DVD on the UFO phenomenon, UFOs Are Real. Get both the book and the DVD, a $40 value, for only $19.99. To order your book and DVD today, go to lamarzuli.net. That's L-A-M-A-R-Z-U-L-L-I dot net. You have heard of the X-Zone? Now watch it on Simo TV, plus 500 video games, live TV channels, free video on demand, worldwide and more. Does this sound like tomorrow's television? Well, it is, but you can have it today, right now. It is Simul TV. 
Simul TV offers what the others only wish they could provide. 15 exclusive channels like X-Zone, Sci-Fi, and Horror. We are worldwide. No other provider offers that. 500 built-in video games. No need to have an extra expensive system. We have them included. Free video on demand. Live streaming events from around the world. Interactive online network and much more. Tomorrow's TV today. Simul TV. Sound too good to be true? Well, it's not. You can have Simul TV today. Sign up at simultv.com. Do it today.